be familiar to the writers of the New Testament. It is a much-quoted chapter in the New Testament, as you would recognize while we read through, I'm sure. Uh, Jesus quoted it, for example, in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. He quotes verse 13. Isaiah, well said of you, says, says Jesus to the Pharisees, this people comes near to me with their lips and honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And Jesus was speaking about the Pharisees' hypocrisy in worship, for example. Paul quoted this chapter. You remember in Romans chapter 9, he quotes verse 16, uh, Shall the clay say to him that formed it, Who art thou that made me? And so on. He quotes it again in Romans chapter 11, verse 8, where he quotes verse 10. Um, he also quotes uh, the same chapter in 1 Corinthians 1.19, quoting verse 14, the wisdom of the wise will perish, the intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Not only so, but I wonder if you notice that there is a reference in Revelation chapter 5 to what we read in verses 11 and 12, the whole concept in Revelation 5 of a seal that has not been opened. Who will open this seal? And they wept tears because nobody could open the seal on the scroll which was the Word of God and the Word of God was sealed up and then the Lamb came, do you remember? And He opened the seal. Now here is where that background comes from in verses 11 and 12. This whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. So it was obviously a significant and familiar chapter in New Testament days and for very important reasons. You do get a key note of the address that Isaiah is delivering right at the beginning in verse 5, where in, ver in verse 1 of chapter 29, where he says in the second half of verse 1, Add year to year, and let your cycle of feasts or festivals go on. Because God's complaint is that Jerusalem and his people in Jerusalem, especially the religious leaders in Jerusalem, are at the very center of the nation's religious life. But their religious life and their religious leadership consist solely in observing externals. And the whole religious life of Judah at this time to which Isaiah is addressing himself, was an externalism. It was precisely the situation of which Jesus spoke to the Pharisees when he says, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now this divorce between the lips and the heart between the outward expression and the inward experience is always utterly fatal. And it is always a sign of an extreme form of spiritual sickness. And we must not imagine that this kind of thing that Isaiah is here speaking about refers to those who engage in liturgy and so on. I came across in a, a comment on this chapter this morning. Somebody speaking about how Isaiah is here addressing in his world the kind of situation you would find in our world with liturgical worship. That is, with an emphasis upon the outward, with people going on saying the same things, and so on. But you know, we cannot hide behind comfortable evangelical barricades like that and imagine that Isaiah is speaking about other people. He is speaking about all forms of divorce between the lips and the heart, between the outward performance and the inward desire, between where our lips are and where our heart is between what we are saying and what we are really feeling, you know.
between, for example, the words that we sing and what's going on in our hearts while we sing them. I was greatly stung when somebody once expounded upon this in my presence and I will never forget his describing how easy it was for us to be appearing with all our being to launch out into these great words of some of the great hymns that we sing, you know. The God of Abram prays. And then looking round and what's actually going on in our mind is so-and-so is coming in late this morning. Or, oh, there's somebody else. And we go off at a tangent into our thinking about them. Our mind everywhere except upon the words that we are using to praise God. Do you know how awful it is if somebody is addressing you? Do you ever get this experience when somebody's talking to you, but you know all the time their mind's a thousand miles away. They're probably looking for somebody else that they're actually wanting to speak to, and they're holding you for a moment or two as a kind of anchor just to keep them there. But their mind is somewhere else. We feel insulted by that, don't we, legitimately? And how much more is God insulted when we are addressing him but our mind is somewhere else altogether? This is the kind of thing that Isaiah is speaking of. Go on, he says, add year to year, let your cycle of festivals go on. And what they are really doing is refusing the brokenness of heart and the contriteness of spirit that really makes God come to dwell with his people. He will dwell with the broken and contrite of heart. That is where he tabernacles. Now, you may remember from chapter 28, if you were here then, that one of the lessons of that chapter was that if we fail to discipline ourselves, God will discipline us himself. That is a true principle that runs right through Isaiah. These people in chapter 28 in Israel in the northern kingdom are being addressed by God, not because they have been using wine, but because they have been indulging themselves. They've been living a life of self-indulgence and indiscipline. And the message is that if we refuse to discipline ourselves, God will discipline us. Now here, the lesson is that if we will not humble ourselves, God will humble us. Notice verse 4. God has said, I will encamp against you all around. Verse 3, I will encircle you with towers, set up my siege works against you. Verse 4, brought low, you will speak from the ground. Your speech will mumble out of the dust. Your voice will come ghost-like from the earth. Out of the dust your speech will whisper. Now the whole principle is that God is going to bring them low. You will know that there are two things that Scripture speaks to us about this theme. It says to us, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And again and again you get this emphasis in Scripture, God's great concern that we might humble ourselves before him. But then you find that there are occasions, as for example in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when Moses is reviewing the history of the people of God in the wilderness, he says, and he humbled you and tested you in the wilderness. Now the point is, you see, they refuse to humble themselves 
before God, and arrogantly defied him, and said it were better for us in the land of Egypt. And God humbled them. That's a great principle, and it's part of the central core of what Isaiah is saying here. Do you notice how in verse 19, when he is speaking about the day of redemption, what will happen in the day of redemption is once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord. Now, humility here is not really a kind of self-effacing spirit or that quality of life that we think of usually when we use the word. Humility is simply bowing before God's lordship over the whole of our life. To humble ourselves under God's mighty hand is simply to live under his sovereign lordship willingly. That's what it means. And here he says, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. And the principle is those who will not humble themselves before God, he will humble. Now once again in verses 5 to 8, there is this assurance that God is a righteous God, even if he uses the Assyrians, he will deal with them righteously. Now, what Isaiah is really saying is we need never be afraid that God is somehow or other going to compromise himself, even when he uses evil men for his purposes, as he did with the Assyrians in Jerusalem because he will come and bring them under his judgment as well. It may be that the Assyrians are the instrument of God to humble his own people, to bring them into the dust, as it were, so that they will ghost-like speak from the earth. Their dust will speak like a whisper. But God himself will come and deal righteously with these Assyrians he has used as the instrument of his purpose. And he comes with forces associated with nature at its fiercest in verse 6. Thunder, earthquake, great noise, windstorm, tempest, flames of a devouring fire. Do you notice how one of the things that is so striking about Isaiah is that you not only get this tender and beautiful picture of God and his infinite grace that we have found in earlier chapters, but supremely you get this picture of God and his greatness. It is a lofty view of God that Isaiah has, an expansive view of his majesty and glory, the kind of God before whom the nations at the end of verse 23 will stand in awe. They will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Now that's a note that we need to recover in our thinking in our own day. Verses 7 and 8 of chapter 29, the godless nations who think they have triumphed will find that their triumph is like a dream. They will be like hungry men or thirsty men, awakening and discovering that neither their hunger nor their thirst is quenched. So Isaiah deals in verses 5 to 9 to 8 with the position of the Assyrians. Now from verse 9, God takes up again the charge against particularly the leaders of Judah. It's a very important thing to remember, of course, that any distinction that we might make between political leaders and religious leaders would be infinitely more difficult to make here 
because this is what is called a theocracy. That is, God was the king over his people. And every area of life was recognized as being under God's sovereign lordship. An important principle in Isaiah. And here he is addressing the leaders, but more particularly the prophets and the seers. Verse 10, halfway through. Now, the point about that is that these men whom he is now addressing are the messengers of God's word, appointed by him to bring his word to the nation. And if ever there was a nation that was desperately needing the word of God in all its power and authority, it was this nation of Judah. But do you notice what is happening? Verse 9 says, Be stunned and amazed. Blind yourselves and be sightless. Be drunk, but not from wine. Stagger, but not from beer. The Lord has brought over you a deep sleep. He has sealed your eyes, that is, the prophets. He has covered your heads, that is, the seers. Now notice how the messengers of God are described. They are described as stupefied, blind, unstable, careless, and without wisdom. And then in verse 11, the word of the Lord is as a sealed scroll to them. Now we would say it was like a closed book. The point is that for these messengers of the Lord, there was nothing in the word of God that they believed they should or could bring to the people of God. For you this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say to him, read this please, he will answer, I can't, it is sealed. This message is a closed book to me. Or if you give it to someone who cannot read and say, read this please, he will say, I don't know how to read. It is impossible for me to interpret it in other words. Now, do you notice these two categories of messengers or prophets? One of them says, the message of God is a closed book. It's irrelevant. It's got nothing to say. It's sealed. We can't get at it. And the other says, I can't make head or tail of this. It's like a child who can't read being presented with Charles Dickens' novels. He cannot make anything of it. And it's a very significant thing that in every generation you get these two responses to the Word of God. And this is what Isaiah finds amongst those who are called to be prophets. One, they say, that's a closed book. And the other, I can't see any sense in this so that I can interpret it. Now what they are called to do clearly is to open the seal of the scroll and to interpret the writing of it to God's people. If you remember when there was revival in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, that's precisely what happened. They took the scroll of God's book and they read it, they opened it and read it and gave them understanding so that they should understand what God had written. That was the calling of the prophet. Now, it's very interesting that these two things that are described in verses 11 and 12 are still there with us. Some time ago, I was interviewing a student for the ministry and was talking to him about um, the sort of thing he would be planning to do. He was apparently uh, not at all evangelical. My task was not to... Uh, 
inquire about the particular theological position he had but about what sort of ministry he would be exercising I said to him you are going to be ordained to the ministry of the word and sacraments now what place does the Bible play in your life and in your ministry that you would be beginning he said I don't understand what you mean well I said let's put it personally then what part does the Bible play in your daily life? None at all, he said. I never open it. I don't see what it's got to do with my daily life. Now I said to him, I noticed from your forms, attempting to appear less shocked than I really was, I said, I noticed from your forms that you have preached quite a bit where do you go for the material that you're preaching? Oh, he said, I ruminate and meditate and then pass on my meditations. Now, uh, that's exactly what Isaiah is saying. This is a closed book, a sealed scroll. But there's something more serious than that. Do you notice what verse 10 is really saying? People who refuse to see become blind, and people who refuse to hear become deaf. The Lord has brought over you, verse 10, a deep sleep. He has sealed your eyes, the prophets. He has covered your heads so that you can't hear the seers. For you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say to him, read this, please, he will answer, I can't, it is sealed. Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, read this please, he will answer, I don't know how to read it. Now, that's something that is in no sense ancient. And the reason is that their hearts are far from God. It is not that their minds are not properly trained. It is simply that their hearts are far from God. Verse 13, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. That is, not by a revelation of God, but by rules taught by men. And they went through the rules, of course, and through the ritual, and their hearts were a thousand miles away from God. Now, that's a very important thing for those of us whose task it is to be leaders in the church of God but it's of enormous importance for all of us as God's people and one of the things that I think we need to in the healthiest sense fear is this divorce between our hearts and our lips these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Therefore, says God in verse 14, I will once more astound these people with wonder upon wonder. And what God is going to do, do you notice, is to make the wisdom of the wise perish and the intelligence of the intelligent 
vanish because it is his own wisdom and his own glory that he will alone permit to be exalted. And there is no question that uh, one of the things that was involved in the decline of the people of Judah was a pride in their own intellectual prowess. And that's one of the things that God cast down. It is a principle that Paul takes up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and that Isaiah is constantly emphasizing that anything that will raise its head to exalt itself over against God, he will cast it down if we will not. Now that's a vital thing for us to grasp. But notice in verse 15 how Isaiah goes on to another characteristic of this kind of life that he is exposing. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us, who will know? You turn things upside down, he says, as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Now here is is Paul's point when he is seeing again the pride of man entering in and emphasizes that we are the clay, God is the potter. We are the creatures, God is the creator. And we are to live in the position of those who are formed by his hands. Can the clay say to him who made it, says Paul, and the clay cannot address the potter in these terms. In a very short time, says God in verse 17, will not Lebanon, that is the glory of Lebanon as a forest, be turned into a fertile field? and the fertile fields seem like a forest. Now, you will notice how everything from verse 17 onwards is going to be turned upside down. Lebanon, which is a forest, is going to be turned into a field. The field is going to be turned into a forest. The deaf are going to hear. The blind are going to see. The humble are going to be exalted. The ruthless are going to vanish. The mockers will disappear. Those who with a word make man out to be guilty in the courts are going to be destroyed by God. Now, you will notice that earlier on he has said in verse 16, you turn things upside down. That is, you put God in the place of man and man in the place of God. But when God begins to make bare his arm, he is going to turn everything the other way around. That is, it will be a mark of the living God coming to move amongst his people that he will turn everything the right way up. Lebanon was a symbol of the great glory and power of men. That was how they viewed Lebanon with its forests. God is going to make it like a flattened field. And the flattened field God is going to make like a forest. Those who were deaf he is going to make to hear. The blind he will make to see. He will write injustices. Now this is going to happen on the day of the Lord. And it probably refers not only to the day when God comes to meet with them, but to that last and great day of the Lord which is to come. Therefore, this is what the Lord who redeemed Abraham, verse 22, says to the house of Jacob. And these are God's words of grace to him, to them. You will recollect how again and again we have found this in Isaiah, that God's ultimate purpose is not just judgment. God's ultimate purpose is never chastisement. God does not delight in discipline. Isaiah has said again and again, judgment is God's 
strange work. His true desire is to draw his people to him in grace. His real longing is that he may pour healing into them and draw them back to himself again. Now you can understand that, can't you? Any parent of any normal kind with any humanity does not delight in disciplining his children. He finds the act of disciplining repugnant to him. Chastising children is something that unless there is something morbidly wrong with him, he will never be able to enjoy. What he longs for is that he is able to embrace them and draw them to himself and see these pale faces becoming lit with joy and blessing again. Now that's exactly what Isaiah says God longs for. He who redeemed Abraham. You remember how Abraham got himself into some messes during his lifetime and came under the discipline of God, but God brought him again to the place of blessing. No longer will Jacob be ashamed and covered with guilt. No longer will their faces grow pale. What is going to happen instead? Well, instead, they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Those who are wayward in spirit will gain understanding, verse 24. Those who complain, that's a bad translation. Those who are stubborn, it really is. It's a word that's applied to the mule in the Old Testament, you know. Those who were stubborn will accept instruction. That's what God wants above all other things. And it is in his grace that he persists and perseveres with us until he gets us to that place. But that is what is in his heart to do. And the trouble God took with Judah to bring them there and the trouble he takes with us to get us there. But thank God he does. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. We thank you for all that you are and for what you have revealed of yourself in Scripture. And now this evening we long that we might learn the lessons that Judah failed to learn for so many generations, that we may be a people whose hearts are right with you, that we may be a people who humble themselves rather than waiting on God to humble them. And we ask that we may gladly give ourselves to you with an openness that will make us walk with you in joy and peace. May your grace and mercy and peace be our portion this night and always. Amen.